All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this evening's webinar, History in Our Backyard. Uh, I'm Eleanor Rangers. I'm the president of the Southeastern, <clears throat> excuse me, the Southeastern Pennsylvania Cold War Historical Society. We are a nonprofit organization that's been in existence since 2010, dedicated to primarily collecting oral histories uh, of individuals who were involved in Cold War related activities uh, in and around the Southeastern Pennsylvania area. Um, but we also do some uh, historical preservation associated with the uh, old Johnsville centrifuge uh, in Warminster, Pennsylvania. So, um, you know, I know some of you, uh, some of our loyal audience who are on this evening have been to our live programs uh, back in what I call the before times, <laughs> before the pandemic hit. And uh, hopefully we may be able to go back to doing live events. Uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed perhaps sometime in 22. So I just have a couple of announcements as usual. And again, here's our History in Our Backyard webinar series. I do wanna let everyone know in case you didn't know today, November 18th is uh, astronaut Alan Shepard's birthday. Uh, Alan Shepard, as you may know, was one of the uh, Mercury astronauts who did training on the centrifuge uh, at, at Johnsville. Uh, in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And these are some uh, photographs actually from uh, uh, Shepard's uh, training uh, at the centrifuge. Um, as a nonprofit organization, we always rely on the generosity of individuals who choose to donate for our efforts. Um, and you know that goes for supporting things such as uh, honoraria for guest lecturers coming from out of town, for example, um, transcriptions of interviews, which is still on my bucket list uh, for the uh, almost 120 interviews that we've conducted uh, since the beginning of our uh, endeavors in 2010. Um, we have done displays locally in the past in the Warminster area. And um, as you probably know, we do have a website um, then, and there's some marginal costs associated with the upkeep of that. Um, if you do have interest, if any of you have worked at NADC, to, you know, make sure to take a look at our coldwarhistory.org site. <clears throat> we do keep, I do try to regularly upload pictures uh, there that you can take a look at and offer commentary on. Um, and we also recently added uh, two new pages, one for what's now, I guess, what the Biddle uh, the Biddle Air National Guard base, the old Willow Grove base, and also the old Naval Air Propulsion Center, which was in Trenton. So um, I put some hist historical information up on both of those sites uh, that you might enjoy seeing some information on as well. Um, <clears throat> we, do main we do record these uh, lectures and we do put them up on our YouTube channel that's under our same, you know, under our name. Um, in addition to the lectures that are archived there, we do have some other uh, items of, of interest there, either related to the centrifuge um, or of other general Cold War interest. So would encourage you to uh, check that out. I do try to keep that updated as well. And uh, for those of you on Facebook, we do have a Facebook page. So I do try to keep that updated as well uh, with our uh, upcoming programs and um, you know, if there are some Cold War related news articles of interest, I do try to post things there as well. So if you're not um, on our email distribution list, you can always get information from our website or from our Facebook site on upcoming programs. I also wanted to put a plug in for uh, the Cold War Museum, uh, which is in uh, Virginia, Northern Virginia. Um, and they actually offer webinars as well. And I've started listening into them and they've been really quite interesting. I've enjoyed them thoroughly. Um, if you have interest in getting on their email distribution list, um, definitely email Jason Hall um, and uh, you can get, you can see his email address there. Uh, they have them, those webinars about once a month and they do charge $20 for those webinars, but I definitely would encourage you to listen in on them. Uh, there is one, another webinar coming up this Sunday. They do them on Sundays at like two o'clock. So, you know, if you're not watching football, it's a nice uh, alternative diversion. Um, and this program's coming up on Sunday. They're interviewing an author who's just written a book uh, entitled The Free World, Art and Thought in the Cold War. So a little different topic than what they usually have, um, but uh, I think certainly would potentially be of interest as well. So I wanted to mention that. 
also coming up in uh, December, our last webinar for the year, uh, and not to be missed, is going to be a panel discussion with uh, individuals who actually had worked at or rode the Johnsville Centrifuge. Um, actually, in its later later years, when it was mostly doing research and training for the Navy and uh, and other and the Air Force as well. But uh, we have a great lineup of folks in December, so definitely not to be missed. Uh, there are a bunch of characters. You're going to really enjoy listening to these guys. So um, I did want to put a plug in for our December 9th program. And also, um, we are starting to plan our 22 schedule, and I'm very excited. Uh, I've been able to actually book Marvin Kalb actually for for January. So definitely mark your calendars for January 13th. Uh, we will have an opportunity to listen to uh, Mr. Kalb regale us with his stories of working as a foreign correspondent during the Cold War. Um, he's in the process of writing three books of his memoirs. Uh, the second of which, Assignment Russia, was recently published. Um, and stay tuned for some announcement about uh, book availabilities that uh, we will be uh, likely giving away. So more to come on that. Um, I know just very briefly, uh, people are always asking, hey, when are you going to go back to live programming at the Centrifuge? And, uh, you know, I'm really just keeping tabs on what's going on with the, you know, with our lovely coronavirus pandemic and community levels of it. So um, I am maintaining these webinars indefinitely because they have been a success and it's allowed us to continue our outreach both locally in the Pennsylvania area, but uh, further, further afield as well. So um, that, you know, I saw no reason to discontinue those. Um, but um, fingers crossed, I'm hoping to perhaps reinitiate some limited live programming in 22. Tentatively, I may have one uh, program going on in May uh, where we have some folks coming out from the Air Force Museum uh, from Dayton. So uh, more to come on that. Um, if any of you are on Facebook, I've actually started to trickle out our uh, schedule for 22 and I've also posted them on our website. So, um, and I'll be emailing kind of the full schedule hopefully before the end of the year if you're on our email distribution list. But if you wanted to get a, get a look at what our lineup is so far, um, definitely take a look at our website because I have all the programs up there. And I also wanted to let people know that are local to Warminster, uh, I don't know if, if you were aware of this, but they are actually going to be opening up a uh, brew pub and, and grill uh, at the, uh, in the Centerfuge building called the Tranquility Brewing, Tranquility Brewing oh. Company. Um, and uh, I'm definitely looking forward to that. And you know, one nice thing is if uh, we go back to live programming, you could stop in for a bite to eat before you go to one of our lectures. So uh, you'll definitely, if you're local to Warminster, you'll probably be seeing more announcements about this very soon. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker this evening. Uh, for those of you who uh, regularly attend our webinars, um, we had the privilege of hearing David talk about the Titan missile program. Uh, I believe that was in June. And he will actually be also returning um, in April of 22 to talk about uh, the, the Regulus program, uh, another missile program. Uh, so that's in April. Um, but uh, without further ado, let me formally introduce David and turn things over to him. So David is a retired plant biochemist living uh, in Tucson with his wife. Um, he's written three nuclear weapon histories, um, as you can see the uh, book cover images there, Regulus, um, a history of the Navy's uh, program with uh, cruise missiles, Titan II, a history of a Cold War missile system, and Minuteman, a technical history of the missile that, de that uh, defined American nuclear warfare. Minuteman, I believe, is the latest of those publications that came out this year. Um, and uh, David actually volunteered at the Titan Missile Museum in Arizona as a historian and tour guide for 15 years. Um, and he was instrumental in the effort to gain national historic monument status for that museum. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to David. Um, I'm gonna stop my screen share and turn things over to him. So. Good evening and uh, welcome. Okay, let me get my screen share going. Okay, does everybody see Minuteman 59 years and counting? Yes, we can. And if yeah. everyone could mute themselves as well, um, 
and maybe uh, go off camera for now, um, just so we have we can take advantage of that added bandwidth. Well, thank you, Eleanor. <laughs> so I'm really pleased to be able to give a talk about Minuteman. I spent five years writing a, a comprehensive history of the program, and so far, so good. It's sold pretty well. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm titling this Minuteman 59 Years and Counting since it's still being uh, deployed until the new one gets built. Hopefully, Congress is going to continue to approve that. So this is an overview because in an hour, <laughs> I can't possibly cover the 59 years of history. So I'm going to talk about the context briefly, site design, construction, propellant airframe, guidance, reentry vehicle, launches, and targeting. Um, so it's going to be kind of a pretty quick a sprint through the program, but I think you'll find it interesting. So context. At, by, at the beginning of the Miniman program, the um, well, my notes are obscured by the. Uh, I don't know how I can do that. Um, well, Atlas D and E were already operational, and Titan One and Titan Two. There were fifty-four complexes that were still under construction for each of those. So on top of the Atlas F and the Titan family of missiles, there were already 180 complexes in, um, in under construction when another thousand launch facilities for Miniman <coughs> and 100 launch control centers were added to the mix. It amazes me how this is all done that easily, but to put it in perspective, these were the locations of the Atlas sites and Titan 1, Titan 2, and all of the Minutemen. And right now, there are only three Minutemen um, wings still on operation. That's Malmstrom, Minot, and F.E. Warren. So the construction timeline has always fascinated me because, as you can see, at about um, well, let's say 90, the latter, latter, the third quarter of 63, 62, there were some 600 sites that are being worked on. I just, I still <laughs> am amazed that they could have all that work being done, especially through these harsh winters that they had to endure. Okay, so site design. The PGM series was a soft pad surface attack ground launch with virtually no protection. And those were the ones that were deployed at uh, Vandenberg briefly. Then they, they also had the next coffin was above ground coffin and that had virtually no protection either. Then they went to the buried coffin which was uh, rated at 25 PSI overpressure protection, which is better than nothing, but not by much. Then with Titan I and Atlas F, they put those into what are called AGM facilities, which were silo, um, silo stored and then surface launched. And those had about 150 to 200 PSI protection, which is much better. Back then, the accuracy of the Soviet weapons was not as good as it evolved to into, so they were able to get away with um, not as much protection. Then Titan II became the first of the silo stored in silo launch missiles, the LGM series, and they were good to 300 PSI. Then they had Minuteman, which was originally was going to be much uh, about 100 PSI and 500 PSI for the LCC. And then they changed that before the um, construction began. And that caused some consternation with the drawings, but they changed it so there was 300 pounds per square inch for the LF and 1000 PSI for the LCC. So this is the typical launch facility design. It's about uh, one and a half, 1.8 to two acres. 
surrounded by a seven foot fence. I don't know if you can see the detail on the uh, where the launcher is, but that's the launcher and the support building. Now, knowing that the support buildings to the east, um, east of the uh, actual launch tube makes this a, a um, wing three, four or five this, um, design because as you see now, wing one Malmstrom had the LF the launch support building on the west side of the um, launch tube. Then, hang on. Then Ellsworth had it on the east side. Both of those were not hardened at all. They were surface, the, the building surface was four inches above, the ceiling was four inches above the ground. So the idea was the last wave was gonna be horizontal at this point. So it wasn't gonna be hopefully with the accuracy of the Soviet weapons. So the hardening could be less. Then as things got worse with the, the accuracy or better, I should say for the Soviets, they did harden the LSB <laughs> for wings three through five by shock mounting some of the equipment. The ultimate hardening came for came in wing six at um, Grand Forks and the 564th Strategic Missile Squadron at Malmstrom. That's when they actually buried the launch support building. Now you'll notice the um, orientation of the LF. The first three were canted at 8.5 degrees off of true north. And with the guidance system change in Minuteman two, and they were able to orient them to true north. This is a typical launcher design. It had two, two levels. Level one had all the equipment, flight control equipment, things like that. Um, the lower level housed the batteries and motor generator. The upper level housed missile control and, and flight control equipment and support equipment and monitoring equipment. But if I go back, one slide here. You can see where that red triangle is. This shows this is an early design because there's no B plug. And I, this next slide will show what I mean by B plug. What happened was they just, they found that these National Nuclear Safety Agency found that it was easy for the safe crackers to break into. Let me see if I can get my cursor over there. Originally, the only, only lock was right here to the left of the hatch. But professional safe crackers could easily, actually pretty easily break that and break in. And so they decided to put the B plug, which is shown by that um, red triangle, that was a 14,000 pound plug of concrete and steel and copper and mylar. Um, it, was, it was normally located, let's see if I can get that to show properly. In the secure position, it was up here with a locking ring and you couldn't get into the silo, the launch facility. It lowered quite slowly and was based originally based on how long from that particular site the security response team could come. So they had lowered so slowly that they could come and catch the intruder, but that made for a long wait sometimes for the people doing maintenance because they had to lower the plug to get in. This is a complicated, you can't really read much of the information, but this just shows level one and level two. Level one held, um, like I said, these power supplies, the environmental control, the in environmental control system for the missile guidance system, access to the, the launch tube itself was from level one. Um, 
I found a guy and interviewed him briefly, although I didn't put it in the book because I couldn't confirm it, who was instrumental in the work platform that they used, the work cage, which was like that used by high rise window washers. And it was um, an innovative idea at the time, but apparently quite an experience to ride in. And the lower level held all the batteries and the motor generator and some of the electrical surge uh, arrestor sets and stuff. The guidance for Minuteman 1 and 2 had to be aligned by something called the azimuth alignment equipment. And the red triangle there shows you the uh, auto collimator, which was used in conjunction with a sight window on the missile to um, tell the missile where it was. Miniman 3 didn't require that, but Miniman 1 and 2. Miniman 1 needed that for its actual launch azimuth. Miniman 2 just needed it to know where directly east was. It's a long story about how that works, so I won't bore you with the details. Missile support and suspension systems, there was quite an evolution of the design of this, which I couldn't cover completely in the book. On the very left was a missile wing one suspension system. The triangle points to the azimuth drive. What they did was when they loaded the missile into the silo, into the launch tube, they had to orient the sight window on the guidance set with the theodolite. So they had to often had to rotate the missile using this azimuth drive to line it up properly. This was the protection by this um, design was not as great as they'd hoped. But they left it at Malmstrom for quite a while and went to the next one, which is in the middle, and it still had the azimuth alignment drive. But this one had a had tie rods and torsion bars that to help protect against the pitch action. The last one was done during the CDB uh, force modernization, and that's the current one used in the uh, system now. It's a massive cage supported, it's a massive pendulum system. And those three dot, three triangles show the, the six, the three pairs of pads that are used to um, cushion against horizontal movement. And I'll show you that in just a, the next slide. This is a computer drawing of the upper system. They have these foam pads. They're foam pads that are pressed against the first stage of the missiles to hold it in place. Then this articulating arm snaps out and aligns the missile. If there's any, any pitch moment, it's not centered in the, in the launch tube, that snaps out. So let me show you how that works. Those are, that's the big foam block and that's got about an inch, inch and a half of space between it and the silo wall and the launch tube wall. It's elastomeric foam, so it cushions it. It's not, it's not rigid foam. It's an open cell, a closed cell foam, and it um, collapses as necessary. Then when you're getting ready to launch, this articulating arm snaps down and recenters the missile. And then as the missile rises it, um, off the launch mount, the bearing at the very top, the roller at the very top, helps to prevent the, the suspension system from hitting the missile as the missile lifts off. Since lifting off with 56,000 pounds of weight, you would expect the launcher to bound, rebound upwards. It was also held by a tether to stop that. This is an example of the T9 trainer. You can see the um, roller there that's the, that snaps out and, and um, engages the silo wall. This is a cage being put into um, one of the sites, and I'm not sure which one this is, but it's a massive structure. This was done in the early 70s, so this has been around now for, what, 40 years. So, so much for the LF. Now we're talking about the Launch Control Center, Launch, con launch Control Equipment Building. Wing one, and wing two had very similar LCCs. 
wing three had the the yellow launcher wing one and two the launcher equipment um, materials support was inside the LCSB the launch control support building so it was soft I'm, I try and figure out why they did that what was soft was the uh, chiller a uh, supply of brine to chill the, the um, air conditioning air. Why they did that without bearing it, I'm not sure. But by the wing three, they decided to put it underground. And so you can see underground, the LCC is obviously still underground. Then you go to wing six and the 564th. And now the LCC has changed positions relative to the support building and the launch control um, building, launch control equipment building is um, now a bit bigger in volume. That's all gone now. Wing 6 and the 564th is gone. So Cheyenne, uh, Effie Warren, Wing 5 and Wings 1 and 2 are still with the, uh, the systems you see up there. So that's the launch control support building. Pretty standard construction. It contained the security necessary to prevent unauthorized entrance to the LCC. And here's the LCC. Now it's an interesting, this is an official Air Force document. They, they're missing the launch, uh, the del air delay tubes, which we'll be discussing shortly. Then wings three and five, three through five, the um, delay tubes are there. That's also underneath, that's the equipment building. And then here's the LCC. Then there's now the, the um, LCC and here's the L, uh, LCEB. But again, they're gone. Okay, and that's, uh, that's the air to blast the de delay tube for the LCC. Okay, so this is the floor plan for wings one through four, one through five. There's a lot of detail in here. What I wanted to do is show you the, the view to the right. We're looking at the uh, MCCC's console. And you can see the chains there. They were connected to the um, spring shock mounting system. And then right next to it in a dark line, is the acoustical enclosure. They had an acoustical enclosure to help try and mitigate the noise from all the equipment, which really didn't help much. They had to later line it with insulating panels to try and cut the noise down. In the Titan program, many of the Titan two MCCCs and DMCCCs and BMATs and MFTs had hearing loss issues down the road because of all the noise, the intensity of the noise. This is what a typical wing two LCC looks like. The person, this is taken during the long life uh, Roman numeral one program. The MCCC in the background is Captain Moneyhun and the DMCCC is Alan Martins. Now, interestingly enough, Alan Martins retired to Tucson, Arizona. So I was able to go and interview him about what he calls the only launch out of an operational silo. Um, it's not really quite true. It was a launch, but it only burned for seven seconds. It was very successful and they wanted to do it again several times, but met all kinds of issues and couldn't actually do it correctly. So construction. This is a video I just came across. The work is different too. First, carve a bowl out of the ground. It's a launcher site excavated exactly on line and 30 feet deep. The silo shaft goes in the bottom. When the bowl's finished, pick up and move to another site, one of 200. Six specialized crews do it six days a week. Their work paces out the job. Shafting follows bowl excavation. Four complete outfits with crews working three shifts around the clock, a 
six-day week. By taking a big gamble on a big new auguring machine, the MK missile men put down the big shafts, all 200 of them, like post holes. Their experience at Sedalia found its payoff at Cheyenne. Some shafts were excavated in hours instead of days. No, it wasn't a case of ideal material. It wasn't just soft ground and easy going. The big augers designed for the job and the largest ever used anywhere fought right through everything but solid rock. As they say, the impossible simply took a little longer, but the job kept right on its schedule. So this is the bottom of one of the launch tubes. Not all the sites were done this way. Most of them actually weren't, but the ones at, at the Cheyenne and the Grand Forks were done this way. And I think some of the ones at the 564th also. Just a massive auger. That's, I'm not an engineer by any means. I just find that to be extraordinary. But look how clean that hole is. It makes what they had to do next much easier. This is a lower launch tube, 52 foot, 12 foot long, 12 feet in diameter. It came, it's made out of half inch steel and they came to them as just the tube. So when it got to this, uh, to the marshalling yard at the wing or in the nearby town, they had to tack weld all the rebar on or, or wire all the rebar on so they could pour the concrete for the outer shell. Now, interestingly enough, I recently found out at Vandenberg where they were building the, the silos at the launch tubes at about the same time, they had the shell much wider and did all the reinforced concrete work on the interior, but that's that was specific to Vandenberg. They must have found it was easier to do it this way. Then you pick that thing up and you lower it in very carefully and you leave four feet sticking out because the base of the launcher equipment room is four feet thick concrete. So the, the launcher equipment room uh, foundations in place. Now they're putting in the inner liner for the launcher equipment room. The walls for launcher equipment room were two and a quarter feet thick. This is the launcher tube, <laughs> launcher equipment room rebar installation for the outer concrete. This is the personnel PAS, personal access, personnel access shaft. That's the, uh, the uh, azimuth alignment sighting tube for doing an alignment based on looking at the monuments that are on the surface. That's a, a, um, a blast valve going into the lower, uh, the lower launcher equipment room level. And that's the upper launch tube sticking up. The, the very top of that's the flush would be flush with the ground and covered by the silo launcher closure door. This is a side view of the LF. The first triangle I show there is the top of the 52 foot lower launch tube. Left and right, you can see the rattle space that allowed the launcher equipment room to be um, isolated from the launch tube. So if the launcher equipment room moved at the top, there was a one foot gap with a rubber sleeve. And on the sides there was, I'm not, I don't recall the answer, I think it was six inches to allow the launcher to um, move slightly after nearby blast. You can see on the left that there was a little sequence of about 170 degrees of the 360 degree um, launcher equipment room installation were um, shock suspended platforms for the electronic equipment. On the right, it was concrete, uh, concrete shelving for the stuff that was not um, launch vibration sensitive. The ceiling of the launcher equipment room was six foot thick. On top of that was approximately three to four, almost four feet of concrete and the side of the launcher closure door was approximately that thick. This is one, this is a great shot that I was actually able to find um, in the congressional collection. If you look at these four places, places I'm marking with the um, 
red dots, those are places where they welded the door shut so they could move it. That's um, a very heavy door. You know, it's an eight ton door when it's filled with grout and three quarter inch plate steel, six and a half feet high, two, two, and not two feet, nine inches thick. Really a massive structure. Most of the, the biggest rebar they used was over one and a half inches in diameter. Number 14 rebar. So that kind of shows how the door swings and latches into place. You could only open it from the inside. So obviously it took us the um, appropriate codes and stuff to be allowed, allow you to get into the, the LCC. The horizontal tunnel there on the right, I've been in the um, Alpha Zero One at Malmstrom and I'm six foot three and it's a bit of a bend to get in, but that had to be the right size to get all the equipment in because they uh, had moved the equipment in obviously after they built the LCC. I think there was an advantage to being short if you were on crew. This is the LCC getting ready to have its exterior coat of concrete. This is the blast lock area. These are, this represents where the blast valve was installed. This is the exhaust line, air exhaust line. We're gonna discuss the blast valve in just a minute. So this is the exterior of a um, site. Uh, this would be either Ellsworth or, well, this could be anything from wing one, to wing five. That's the exhaust tube going to the surface. And that, that U-shape is the delay tube. This is how the blast valve detail, this is from the Titan II, but it's the same idea. The air coming in on this side goes through the delay tube and then into the LCC or wherever it's supposed to go. When the blast takes place, the blast valve wave goes up this delay tube Simultaneously, the um, blast valve shuts to the position shown by the second red triangle. And that means by the time the shock wave gets around the delay tube, it's shut and protected. Pretty clever idea, I thought. Okay, this is the LCC wall thickness comparison. That's four feet, three inches thick concrete and steel. The thickest part there by the door is seven foot thick. That's impressive an amount of concrete to me. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the propellant and airframe. This is one of the fascinating stories in writing the book and doing the research. In the uh, war, during the World War II, they, uh, the British came up with the idea of the star core. And the, the reason you want a star core is you get a very neutral um, thrust, meaning it doesn't change much. You get it, it comes up, stays the same, and then tapers off instead of a, a um, what do they call it? Not a gradual, a um, aggressive curve where it's continually increasing. And the reason that's so is because if you look at the star shape, the surface area of that burning area um, remains constant until the very end versus uh, if you had just a round core, it would be going from a narrow surface area to a much larger surface area and burning much faster and the acceleration would be much faster. So that was the British invention. The other contribution, which is doesn't seem to be very important based on the fact that it's only about an 8% increase in thrust, but that's what was needed to make Miniman and Polaris work. Keith Rumble and Charlie Henderson of Atlantic Research Corporation demonstrated in the early 50s that if you add powdered magnesium or aluminum to the propellant, you get a 8% thrust increase. That's why this flame is so bright from the Miniman or Polaris or Poseidon launch because of the aluminum that's being burnt. 
Magnesium and aluminum were very similar. They went with aluminum because it was much safer to handle. I did have a chance to interview Charlie Henderson. That's kind of an interesting story. I found from a document in the NASA archives that uh, Charlie B. Henderson had written a few um, notes to an author, J.D. Hunley, who writes about propulsion system development. So just because I'm shy and retiring, I decided to try and find Charlie B. Henderson. The, the address on the letter from 15, 20 years ago was somewhere in Virginia. So I typed into been verified, Charlie B. Henderson. I knew his age is approximately 90 years. And up came some addresses that were in North Carolina. So I, one of them was 90 years old, Charlie B. Henderson. So I called him and I asked him, is this a Charlie B. Henderson that was involved in aluminizing propellants? And he said, yes, who's, who's asking? So I told him what I was doing. We had a very nice conversation and he sent me several of the, um, his collection of documents that um, just showed how this was all discovered. So this is Miniman one through three, stage one. It has the star core, five point star core, four nozzles, and um, the ignition was done at the very top of the stage. And that's true, and that's, that same design has been uh, through the, the years. Uh, they've washed out the propellant and replaced it, but that same design has been through the years all this time with both with Miniman one, two, and three. But then I'm not showing you Miniman one, second stage. This is Miniman two and three, stage two. They put a submerged <laughs> nozzle, single nozzle instead of four. They went with a round core for some reason. And the, um, the single engine bell makes roll control very difficult, impossible. So they came up with something called the liquid injection thrust vector control, which had actually been invented quite a few years earlier in jet engine applications. What happens is um, freon gas originally, and then strontium perchlorate um, now as an environmentally more sensitive material is injected into the um, thrust exhaust stream of the engine and uh, deflects the, the thrust and pit and roll pitch or, or yaw, but it can't do it for roll. So they had to put the gas controlled, gas powered, compressed gas powered roll control system in. So this is what happens when you put a little bit of the liquid injection thrust vector control material into the, the exhaust stream, you can deflect it or pitch and yaw, simplifying greatly the design of the nozzle. The original stage three had something called spiraloy, which was a glass filament like fiberglass winding technique that had been invented by Richard Young at his own laboratories. In theory, glass fibers could have a girth strength of over 100,000 PSI, equivalent to treated steel, but with a density nearly that of magnesium. He patented the technique, and this that an, a technique that enabled dome and enclosures to be fabricated monolithically. This is stage three, minimum one stage three thrust termination. This is the actual um, propellant layout for stage three. What I've just shown with that um, triangle is one of the um, thrust termination ports. What happened was thrust termination point port was blown off. That allowed it in all four quadrants. That took the pressure off the flame front. And, and interestingly enough, that will exhaust and, and actually extinguish the flame. And so that was how the, the um, Navy came up with that first with Polaris quite a bit earlier than the Air Force. It mystified me for years at the Titan Missile Museum because we had some Vernier engines on stage two and they blew the nozzle off and said it, <laughs> it just stopped the thrust. And I couldn't figure that out until I researched the Minuteman and realized what they had done was by, by blowing off the nozzle, they decreased the pressure and decreasing the pressure extinguished the flame. 
The Miniman 3 had a post boost propulsion system, which some people regard as the stage four, though that's not true. The top tank was the uh, fuel that was monomethyl hydrazine, very toxic. The oxidizer is nitrogen tetroxide. In the middle was the axial engine, which gave it directed thrust. And the four dots and the four quadrants are the attitude control. And this is the bottom of the um, stable platform guidance set poking through this wafer. So this shows the relative sizes of the four versions of Miniman. Whoops, that's one I wanted. Um, well, let's go back to the other one. The color's a little easier. What the red triangle notes is this drawing's incorrect because it doesn't show the skirt dimension. It gives a dimension, but it doesn't show the skirt. On Miniman 1A and B, the left and leftmost and second in from the left, you can see the skirt. The original Miniman had a flared skirt and they realized that was causing drag issues and they wanted to get a little more range. So they went to a cylindrical shirt, skirt, had three launches that were highly successful. So when you see a missile on display and it's got the flared skirt, that's got to be one of the research missiles they, they um, donated to a museum. By the colors, you can see that up through stage three in the green, those, that dimension of the missile stayed constant over the four variants. What changed was the number of wafers and, and uh, instrumentation, depending on whether it was a research launch or an operational launch with telemetry. And then finally on the very right is the Miniman Roman numeral three with the much different um, reentry vehicle. Uh, shroud. The shroud changed from an ablative shroud to a titanium shroud um, on the upper left, upper right there. So guidance. Very critical thing that uh, Autonetics had going for them that nobody else had was something called the free rotor gas bearing gyroscope. At the time they made the bid for the Miniman guidance system, they had one that had been running for since 1952. So that makes it about six years this device had been running. The idea is the, um, there's a very, very, very thin film of hydrogen or helium gas. And when they start the rotor going, it lifts off the, the bearing and spins at high speed. This gives them a two degree of freedom gyroscope so they only needed two gyroscopes in the guidance system instead of the normal three. Donald, Donald Duncan and Joseph Boltinghouse invented this and I was able to, his daughter contacted me about this, my book and I was hoping she had some original papers of his, her dad's and most of what he did was for the Polaris program and if not, it was a different kind of gyroscope. The Miniman guidance control structure, this was enclosed in a hermetically sealed uh, device. That's the stable platform, which will be seeing the real, the real deal in just a minute. This is a, the second uh, dot there on the left is the D17B guidance computer. The other half held the control electronics, flight control electronics. The guidance system needed to be kept at 65.5 to 68 degrees using coolant via the upper umbilical of the missile. This is a view at the Cheyenne Museum, F.E. Warren Museum. You can see the stable platform. I was tried to get them to open up the, um, the computer torus to see the guidance system in more detail. And they um, quite reasonably declined to do it because they didn't know if they could get it shut again. And I understood that. So I thought, well, that's the way it is. Then a good friend of mine who was involved in the flight testing told me he had been at the 574th um, lobby at Vandenberg. And he took a picture of this and said, do you know what this is? And I said, yeah, it's the stable platform for an NS10Q1 guidance system. 
So in the middle is what's called an inside out gimbal. Most gimbal, most gyroscopes have an outside in gimbal, gimbal rings. And Autonetics didn't want to mess with the slip rings and the issues with that. So they had this design that was similar to what was used in the V2. These two objects are the gas bearing gyroscopes. You only needed two, like I said earlier. The knobby thing in between the two is the counterbalance weight. These are the two velocity meters. There were three velocity meters. The other one's hidden. And the NS17 and NS20 stable platforms went to the gimbal design. I was in gimbal ring design, but they didn't use slip rings. They changed the way the system ran so they didn't have to use slip rings. This was made out of beryllium, as was the earlier system. Beryllium is very toxic to machine, so, but it's extremely lightweight and very um, resisting flexing. So that was why it was chosen. So that's the uh, rotor, the uh, gyroscope. That's the tank, the beryllium ring. This is an outstanding description, um, demonstration of the power of integrated circuits. On the right is the the um, E17B computer from Miniman 1, all discrete components. On the left is the computer for the the D37 from Miniman 2 and 3. On both of them, there was a small disk drive with very relatively little memory capacity compared to now. You can see it's a foot long ruler there to the left of the D37B. So much, much smaller. At one point, the Air Force and NASA had over 90% of the integrated circuits manufactured in the United States they purchased. In fact, the, the Air Force betting on the use of integrated circuits, which caused problems with the reliability early on, um, because they thought the reliability for integrated circuits would be similar to that for transistors, and it turned out not to be the case. But the important thing is the capacity to, to build guidance systems for a thousand of the Miniman missiles required companies built making vast capacity to do this. When the design, when the um, construction of the guidance systems kind of slowed down, they had all this capacity. And they decided that's, that would help make the decision of the personal computer come into play because they needed a market for all of these LCs, integrated ICs, these integrated circuits they were making. So basically you can thank the Air Force for the, or curse the Air Force for the generation of the birth of the modern PC. The parts for the electronic part count for the Miniman 1 was 14,672, and then the D37B was 4,500. The volume was a decrease from 1.6 to 0.43 cubic feet, and the weight was decreased from 61 to 38 pounds. I tried to find what kind of range increase that difference in weight would be, and that remains classified. So this is a marked a Miniman Roman numeral three NS20 guidance system compartment. That's the um, stable platform. This is the D37 computer. This is an amplifier set. And this is a missile guidance system control computer. That's on display at the Smithsonian um, National Air and Space Museum. Something that amazed me was I tried to get a use of this for free and it cost me 70 bucks because a, a um, private entity <coughs> governs the use of a lot of the photographs. So it was $70 well spent, but if you're ever at the museum, it's worth going to see. It's got a plexiglass cover on it under the, the, the display that they have. Okay, the reentry vehicle. I was fortunate enough to um, interview twice the gentleman who was the head engineer for 
Avco in designing these reentry vehicles. Phil Foti, who Phil Foti, who has since passed away. Long story short, I tried to find, I went to Textron finding that they had purchased Avco years ago in the 80s. And I cold called them and said, I'm looking for anybody who was involved in Avco designing reentry vehicles. And the guy said, I know exactly who you need to talk to, but I'm a marketing guy and I need to go on a marketing trip, but I'll call you when I get back. And I thought, yeah, sure he will. Well, he did. And then he introduced me to Phil and that allowed me to um, interview the original scientist. This is a Mark IV, which is on Atlas. This is a Mark V, much smaller. That was on Minimum 1 <laughs> and 1A. This is a cross-section. This is a real interesting story. Um, I'll try and make it short. I tried to get a copy of this, a cleaner copy of this from the Air Force Historical Research Center. And they said their copy was still classified and they couldn't give it to me. So I had a friend redraw the one that I have that's not classified. At the top is Avcoite, which you'll see in a minute why that's important. And this, well, let's just go ahead and go to that since I'm running over. Avcoite was a ceramic material embedded in a honeycomb of magnesium. And it took the brunt of the heat of reentry. This is a typical Mark V reentry shell. And it's about three thirty seconds of an inch worth of char during reentry. So it really did make a huge, uh, did successfully um, prevent heating up of the warhead. These are two missiles: a Mark V on the left and a Mark XI on the right. And those fins that you see there have nothing to do with the RV. There are telemetry antennas. Launches really quickly. This is the first launch on 1st of February, 1961. What's unique about this picture is the umbilicals have just released. And at the bottom, you can see the color, the bright orange flame. That's the moment of ignition of stage one. The first, the first launch was totally successful. All three stages performed as, as pro appropriate and the guidance system guided the missile to the right location. Not so good on the first silo launch. What happened was there was a vibration that caused the guidance system to think that it was time to separate stage two and three, the two and one. And so it did it just as it was emerging from the silo and blew up. So this is the Casmel, uh, Casmelia Express, minimum 1B on 15 June, 1993. Launch is good, but unfortunately it's heading the wrong way. It's supposed to be going out to sea and it's aiming toward Casmelia, so they had to blow it up. This caused a massive fire on the base. Turned out two wires had been inadvertently switched in the guidance system. No, we don't need to see that again. Targeting, real quickly. The targeting for Miniman was Miniman, well, the core industry areas are located in those triangles. And you can see that's reasonably close to most of the missile bases. Titan Roman numeral two didn't have the ability to get into China, much of China. If you look at what was available for Miniman, the Miniman launch from Malmstrom had that range. Melsworth had that range. Then the three RVs on Miniman 3 had these three ranges. You can see by the time the third Miniman, um, for the third reentry vehicle from Miniman 3 landed, it was going to cover pretty much anything China had to offer and, and a lot of the Middle East. So in summary, I just want to summarize the force mix from 1962 to 2019. It held at a thousand missiles until the um, peacekeeper silos were removed. And were, 50 were removed for peacekeeper at Warren. And then in 1990, <laughs> 91, 92, they removed all the Minuteman two. And so now we're down to 400 missiles and uh, that's where we sit today.
reason for the 50 fold reason 50 missile reduction at, when they occurred was to provide missiles for test launches since the uh, assembly manufacturing had been shut down many years earlier. So I apologize for taking so long, but that's the um, end of my show. Wow, that was great. And a lovely picture of your wife <laughs> that we can see. Yep, 45 years of marriage. All right, well, that's wonderful. Well, I don't, I have a couple of questions and I know that uh, we did have one question. Let me go to the chat uh, so I can see the question. Um, this question comes from Joe Romito, um, and he wanted to know how far below ground were the missile launch personnel? Depended on the LCC was anywhere from 30 to 60 feet, buried 30 to 60 feet, depending on the geology. Hmm. Um, let's see, I've got several questions actually, maybe just to, to start off the discussion. Um, I see one from Dan. Can I answer that one? Absolutely. Why were they concerned about intruders? The above ground wasn't security, wasn't that poor. It was just that these were unmanned sites. The launch facilities were unmanned, unlike everything else. The Titan, they were manned. Atlas F, they were manned. And all the Atlas and Titan, Roman numeral one, were also manned. So here you had unmanned sites that someone could maybe park a vehicle on top of the launcher closure. There's all kinds of stuff. And back in the day, they didn't have television surveillance. They just had these uh, radar systems that worked pretty on and off. So it wasn't that they were, that the above ground security was that poor, it's just that they were unmanned. So by the time they got out there, they were worried that someone could have done something detrimental to the site. Hmm. One of the things I found that struck me is when those film clips that you were showing about the construction of the silo. Um, I guess two things that immediately I had a question about. Number one, how long did it typically take to build one of these silos? And secondly, the personnel that are there, the construction crew, were they uh, part of the Air Force or were they well, like civilian? They were civilian. They were uh -huh. civilian. And how long it took, if you do the math, and I've done the math and I can't explain what my calculational error is, but if you do the number of uh, launch tubes and launch facilities and, and LCCs constructed and divide that by the number of days it took, you come up with something like four and a half days, which oh. makes no sense. So my math has got to be wrong, but a typical um, silo the launch facility being dug with the auger could take anywhere from several hours to a day, depending on the geology of the site. Morrison Knudsen really, that is an incredible application of drilling capability to do, to use those big augers. Wow. Um, actually, I did want to just make one comment. You made the, you've made the comment about the integrated circuits and that at one point, you know, in the mid sixties, if I, if, if I remember correctly, between NASA and the Air Force, they took up most of the <laughs> integrated circuit uh, market um, or purchasing the market. And actually a little bit of a tie-in to the Pennsylvania area, um, Philco Ford was one of the uh, contractors that helped produce the, uh, I think it was the Raytheon integrated circuits. So uh, yeah. Philco Ford at the time was located in Lansdale, Pennsylvania. So a little bit of uh, connection of that part of history to Pennsylvania. Yeah, it was the early, early to mid part of the 60s. Yeah. Were there, um, another question, this may be rather naive, but, you know, how did we learn about putting these missiles into a silo and, you know, all the logistics of launching that? And was any of that uh, knowledge uh, about missiles did any of that come from the paperclip guys, the guys from Piamunda? Uh, no, no, it, it came from the British. I was able to locate back before the internet. It was a long distance, expensive long distance call, but I interviewed Barry, I don't remember his last name, but um, an engineer who came up with the in-silo launch for the Blue Streak missile, IRBM, 
that the British were going to deploy and then decided not to because they bought the Polaris submarines. Mm. But the British did the, the seminal work on in silo launch. Okay. Um, another question I have is, um, you know, that we've been operating these since the since the 60s, early 60s. And I think back to the June talk about Titan and how, you know, thinking about the Damascus incident in 1980, um, and we still have three active Minuteman sites. Um, we're talking about aging technology. You know, I start thinking about what's what's the possibility of having another Damascus-like incident in one of these three sites? Any any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, basically the, the um, it would take a detonation, a bullet or something like that to the, the stage one and two are not that kind of material, but stage three is actually classed as a certain class of explosive. So the chances of that happening are so small that over a 40, 59 year period, there's never been an explosion. There was a retro rocket, I mean, a, a RV that popped off due to a mistaken maintenance so, protocol in December of 64. Um, there was an accident where a gentleman was killed because he didn't follow procedures with that, the third form of the missile suspension support system. But other than that, um, I'm not aware of any fatal accidents or the potential for them. The solid, that's one of the reasons they went to solid propellant, much, much, much safer and, and to use uh. than, uh, than liquids. Right. Well, I'm going to stop hogging the q and I'd love to open it up for anyone else that has questions. I know there's a lot of detailed data, but that's how I write books because without this kind of a history, this stuff's disappearing pretty quickly. Yeah. It's been a common theme in several of the, of the lectures we've heard this year. I mean, um, you know, we heard that on our lecture about the X-20 program and um, you know, about trying to, to get anything that's, you know, not, not active anymore. Everything is disappearing. It just gets discarded otherwise. Well, most of the peacekeeper stuff has been destroyed because Martin didn't want to keep it. And so they just shredded it. Hmm. There's some people who want me to write the peacekeeper history, but due to my health, I don't think that's going to happen. Hmm. Yeah, I was just going to ask where you work. <laughs> is that your next book on the Peacekeeper? No, what I'm doing now is researching the history of the missile suspension systems and the Operation Button-Up concept that, that generated that B-plug. When I toured the, the wings in August signing books, um, I shared with them that that was an original equipment. And none of the personnel knew that. They thought the B-plug was, was original equipment. But at Malmstrom and Ellsworth, it was not. Huh. Wow. All right. Anyone? Oh, we had another. Yeah, comment. John Clark. I've, I've, yeah, I've read that book. That's a well-written book. It's really a fun read. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes can. I can. Oh, hi. Uh, for, for my all my career, I was um, seagoing. And uh, I uh, didn't think that much about the um, Minuteman and uh, so forth. I just thought that, hey, you put a missile in the ground and shoot it off. And, but uh, this whole uh, photographs and, uh, and, and details uh, is an eye opener to me because uh, I didn't realize, you know, how much uh, detail really goes into uh, just making those uh, uh, missiles um, capable. And I was, yeah, uh, it's, I really it's appreciate a, what you did. Well, thank you. It's my idea of a swell, <laughs> a swell time, which unfortunately my wife only learned to agree to this last book, is um, I get immersed. It took me five years to write it, and I'm missing an entire, I miss the, um, the research, the joy of the research and finding that little bit of detail that I thought I wouldn't be able to find and finding those gentlemen I found, that's the thrill I get from writing these books. Let me ask you one quick question. Um, you know, you hear about these Minuteman sites 
uh, in and around the uh, communities that are abandoned. And people um, have uh, um, moved into them. <laughs> no, none of the Minuteman sites, you can do that. They've been destroyed. You're talking about the Titan II. I, I think, sir, you're talking about the Titan II sites, which, yeah. yes, there's a dentist, uh, not a dentist, the pharmacist in, in Tucson that bought one and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars renovating it. He built a house over the um, access portal, and you can go down into the <laughs> silo and and the LCC is stripped of equipment. But if you got the money, you can buy a Titan II or a, an Atlas F or a Titan numeral one uh, else launch facility. But Minutemen's silos have all been, and launch facilities and LCCs have all been detonated and filled in. Wow. They certainly sound like a so solid structure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I didn't include they didn't include pictures of the um, demolition, but yeah, they're they didn't blow them up. They blew the headworks up, but they didn't go down all the way. They filled the launch tubes with um, debris. Well, let me say thank you very much. It was really enlightening to um, see the type of details, uh, uh, things that I was never involved in, but um, I, I could see from the. Uh, the gimbals and everything else that uh, there's a lot of similarity between the uh, well the um, the navy's gimbling system for the navy's Polaris was I think really extraordinary it's covered in my book but the Polaris system one of the chapters in the book is from Polaris came Minuteman because without the naval research for the propellants and showing the thrust termination despite the Air Force saying that's not true the memos I've seen. The uh, Navy beat him to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much and have a good night. And, uh, I will. Thank you for your questions and your service to the country. Thank you. All right. All and Norman, right. I, owe, I owe your response to your email, so I will respond to you. Well, there's, there's no rush. And I'm, I'm just doing what I can day by day. All and right. I'm here. You know, we can always talk. Great. And thank you, Eleanor, for doing what you want, what you're doing. Oh, so, you're yeah. quite, quite welcome. Keep up the good work. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Anyone um, else with any questions? Quiet group tonight. <laughs> Either that or they're asleep. No, I thought it was it was quite interesting. Anybody in the audience have Parkinson's? I do. I've got four jokes for you. You want to hear them? Or are you <laughs> going to hear them anyway? What's what's the favorite um, alcoholic beverage of a par Parkinson's patient? Martinis, shaken, not stirred. Oh no! <laughs> How do you know a, a, a Parkinson and Morris code operator has Parkinson's? They stutter. <laughs> What's the why do Parkinson's patients seem to be so friendly? We're always waving. Oh no. Why are you considered to be so angry? We're always shaking our fist. <laughs> so the day I got diagnosed with Parkinson's, I made up those four jokes and I tried to attain a sense of humor all this time, but it's the symptoms are accelerating. And I just glad I got my book finished before they get too too much worse. But it is what it is so all right well we are looking forward to having you i'm going to be optimistic and that you'll be back in april to talk about the regulus missile so uh, I, I, I certainly hope so i'm seeing if i can find some film all right deep brain stimulation i have a the, the form of parkinson's called cortico basal degeneration which is extremely rare and it doesn't respond to um, carbidopa levodopa to have deep brain stimulation, I need to respond to carbidopa levodopa. So it's kind of out. And my neurologist says she, if it was her brain, she wouldn't experiment and see if it helped. Uh. So the idea of putting electrodes in my brain is not not quite that much fun. Yeah. It's a miracle cure for the people that do have the Parkinson's that responds to carbidopa levodopa. I mean, it's extraordinary. Uh. All right. Well, I wish you, I still wish you stable health. I will say that. Um, and uh, I want to thank everyone as always for 
listening in to our uh, lectures. And again, please join us on De in December. We will have a uh, centrifuge panel. So definitely not one to be missed to, to end the year. And you will see some announcements going out by on our email distribution list soon regarding the 2022 schedule. So I want to thank everyone again um, and have a great Thanksgiving. I know that's coming up next week already. And uh, make sure to set your alarm clocks for 4 a.m. Eastern time because we are going to have a partial lunar eclipse this evening. So um, I don't know if I'll be able to see it here. I don't know if the weather's clear enough. I haven't looked outside, but if it's clear where you are, you may want to check it out. Eleanor, did I send you a copy of my PowerPoint presentation for Titan II? I seem to have erased it. I believe I have it, so I can certainly get that to you as well. well that would be great if you could send that to me. I, I'm kind of keeping an archive of this for the next time I get asked to do something. Yep, absolutely. Okay. And uh, yeah, I will great. definitely do that. So thank you, everybody, right. for listening. Well, thank you. And, uh, have a great Thanksgiving All and right. get over COVID successfully. <laughs> All right. Well, have a good evening, okay. everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.